Welcome all to uh, the second day of the uh, 2016 Open edX conference. Uh, I hope you all had a uh, really great and uh, inspiring day yesterday. I know I did. Um, so uh, thank you all for that, and uh, let's keep it going today. Um, I'm going to start off just with a few um, logistical details about uh, the next two days, hands-on days. So this is the first time that we're, we're doing this. We've done a, a hackathon in the past following the conference, but this is the first time we are actually offering uh, tutorials and workshops. So I just wanted to uh, sort of get everyone up to speed on that if, uh, if you had some uh, questions or concerns. So the hackathon uh, will be kicking off uh, tomorrow morning here at uh, 9 in the morning. Um, and then we will move to Lathrop 282 for hacking. Um, and that's, that's where uh, the majority of hacking will take place. The other uh, Lathrop 200 rooms are available if you have a, a larger group and you want to uh, move there to, to work together, um, you're welcome to do so. Um, and then uh, we'll be uh, keeping uh, Lathrop open um, a bit later. Uh, I know this was something that people asked for last year uh, when we had the hackathon in Boston. Uh, so we listened and heard you. Um, and then we will have uh, presentations. Uh, we'll start at 3 on Friday, and we'll send around a uh, sign-up sheet for uh, presentations to show off all the great work that people have done uh, during the hackathon. Uh, tutorials, uh, so these will be in um, a, a bunch of the breakout rooms. So Thursday, there will be less breakout room space for the hackathon until the tutorials are over around 4.30. Um, but then later on Thursday and all day Friday, those rooms will be available. Um, the capacity is limited for those, so um, you make sure that you've RSVP'd for those tutorials, uh, and you can do that on the uh, SCHEDGE website on, at uh, con.openedx.org slash SCHEDGE. Um, the first tutorial start at 9 a.m. Um, and then food and drink during the uh, hands-on days. Uh, we will be providing uh, coffee uh, all day, both days. Um, breakfast and lunch uh, are on your own. Otherwise, uh, we have uh, directions to um, the Trusteder Union food court. Uh, there are other food options in 10 to 15 minute uh, walking distance. Um, so that, that's the, those are the logistical details about um, the next two days. Does anyone have any burning questions that they think that everyone needs to know. Okay, great. Um, so uh, with that all said, um, we have a very exciting announcement and I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Carlos delgado Cruz from Universidad uh, Carlos III, Madrid. So good morning. I have a very important announcement to make, namely that the next edX, Open edX conference will be in Madrid, Spain. I guess you all know where Madrid is, but just in case, there's a small map. Madrid is well communicated with the airport, I think the fifth biggest airport in, in Europe, and with direct flights from, well, from the US, uh, from almost everywhere, not from San Francisco, but I came a few days ago to Los Angeles directly to 12 and a half hours flight, but it's direct and you can, okay, I guess it's, it's very well communicated. Let me show you just a promotional video of Madrid in order to, next slide. Fine earlier, but now everyone's on their laptops in this room. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Madrid is great. Madrid is awesome. <laughs> Good. So let me show you then a few slides of my university. We, are several, we have several campuses. This is the engineering campus in the south of Madrid. This is a large auditorium that holds over 1,000 people. So we can fill it up if you all come. Uh, it's a great place. This is another smaller auditorium. Oh, this is Anand. Okay, he was there already. <laughs> good. So I think we have good facilities to host this, this conference. Uh, I have another video of the university, but I don't know whether to show it or not. Or, or to let's, let's try. So to just, 
but probably the same will happen. Okay, good. Never mind. Um, I'd like to announce also that the Open edX conference will be co-located with the eMOOCs conference. eMOOCs is the European MOOCs conference, which has been hold, held in the last years, uh, 2014 in Lausanne, Switzerland, 2015 in Mons in Belgium, 2016 uh, this year in Graz in Austria. So this will be at the beginning of the week. So the week will be the 22nd to the 25th, 5th and the 6th of, of May, 2017. The two first days will be eMOOCs. Wednesday morning will be a joint session between eMOOCs and Open edX, and then we'll continue up, up, um, with Open edX um, Wednesday and Thursday. There will be many other events also, uh, which make, will make this week an, a MOOC week in Europe, in Spain, in Madrid. Uh, let me finish up by saying that, uh, as you can see from the 20 euro bill, Europe is betting on MOOCs. <laughs> and this is where you have to go next year. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. We're incredibly excited about this opportunity to uh, join Carlos and uh, University Carlos uh, III Madrid. Um, we're really excited about them hosting this, and we think it's going to be a great event. So we hope uh, you all will join us there. Um, so next, um, I would like to introduce uh, uh, one moment, please, while I switch presentations. Do, 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 do. There we go. All right, so next I'd like to introduce uh, Mitchell Stevens, uh, faculty of the Graduate School of Education, uh, who has been involved in their uh, online learning initiatives since uh, 2012. Uh, welcome, uh, Mitchell. Thanks, Joel. I'm not Ellen Jun. <laughs> but one of my best friends is Ellen Jun. Uh, it's an honor to be here. Um, really looking forward to the opportunity. Um, that, that is an emoji on my uh, title slide. Uh, you know, we keep telling each other that the, the academic lecture is an expensive relic of the past and that online learning is going to put the nail in the coffin of the academic lecture. And here we are <laughs> in a lecture hall. Uh, that said, the lecture is changing and probably needs to change. And as I was thinking about um, how to present my remarks, I thought, what representational genre is most at odds with the academic lecture? And I think emojis might be one representational genre that is arguably at odds with the academic lecture. So I thought I'd, I thought I'd put them together uh, and, uh, um, and, and see what might happen. Um, I'm going to uh, limit my remarks so that we have a good bit of dis uh, discussion, Q&A time at the end. Um, so I'll, 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 I'll try to be um, as concise as I can. Uh, since 2012, when Stanford moved with great ambition, um, or with renewed ambition, shall I say, into the online learning space, um, I've had the pleasure of, of, of working closely uh, with the engineers and instructional designers um, uh, and, and faculty members and researchers who are part of that space. And sometimes they even do me the, the, the favor of, of, a of treating me like one of them, but actually I'm not. I'm a, I'm a sociologist uh, and a political economist. Uh, I've spent a, a good portion of my uh, career um, uh, trying to figure out um, uh, in a concise way um, how US higher education is financed and governed. Uh, has turned, it's taken me about 15 years to come to um, uh, an emoji level uh, understanding uh, of this complicated sector. Um, and that investigation began for me uh, when I uh, spent a year and a half as a participant observer in the office of a highly selective liberal arts college 
back east, I love to say back east, um, that uh, you would be very happy uh, to send your, probably be very happy to send your son or daughter to. Um, I entered that office as a researcher uh, because I had long been interested in educational measurement. Um, uh, sociologists uh, study measurement um, not as a, as a, 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 a scientifically or morally or culturally neutral phenomenon, but, um, but as an important cultural project in its own right. Uh, it's deeply political. It, uh, it tends to transform um, the, the things that it purports merely to represent numerically. Um, and I thought, uh, I thought that selective college admissions might be a, a good place to, to look at how measurement happens uh, in practice, uh, uh, lots of different kinds of, of measures of merit get incorporated by selective college admissions offices. Uh, certainly lots of measures of academic accomplishment, but colleges and universities in the United States uh, care about a lot of other things um, than just academic accomplishment. Um, they, uh, uh, they care about lots of things that I, y y we, we take them so for granted in the United States that we often forget how peculiar they are globally. Um, uh, I found myself asking questions like, you know, why did a, a highly selective private school in the eastern United States um, worry about having a student from North Dakota every year? Why was it so important to so many of the people who worked at this school that I studied um, that, the, that the campus be physically beautiful? Why did the college have to be physically beautiful? What's this thing we do in the United States with a sticker price and a net price, right? Well, the sticker price is $62,000, but the net price is 21, th well, why do we do that? What is football doing in the middle of US higher education? Oh, but not just football, lacrosse and water polo and field hockey and gymnastics and director's cups. What's, all, what's that about? Why residential, right? The big fact of, of, of cost in US higher education is this residential part, what my colleague at Michigan, Elizabeth Armstrong, calls the simple fact of co-presence. That's the cost center, right? The opportunity cost that got us all in the same room at the same time to have this interaction is the real cost center. And we pile it on in the United States. Four years, full time, 24 hour co-presence, if you're lucky. Why? Why tax exempt? Have you seen that place out there? Right? Every palm tree and every blade of grass is subsidized by the state of California, the people of Palo Alto, and the United States federal government. Are you sitting down? This is a nonprofit organization. Those are the sorts of questions that I, that I started to ask when I did this uh, little study a million years ago. Um, and in the process, I, I, in, in, the, in the course of trying to answer those questions, I, I went on a sort of field trip across the social sciences, history, economics, political science, sociology, um, and was pleased to be part of a, an ongoing national conversation uh, of sort of trying to think through these, these peculiar institutions that we call colleges and universities. Um, uh, and I've had a lot of help with that. Um, the, the, uh, I wouldn't wish social science on, on anything, right? Um, uh, but, so, but higher education really hasn't had the, the social science that it deserves relative to other institutional sectors. We know a lot more about multidivisional firms and state bureaucracies, and welfare agencies, and families, and religious organizations, and the internet than we know about Harvard, and Princeton, and Yale, and Stanford, and De Anza Community College. Um, our, our organizations have largely been exempt from social scientific scrutiny, um, which is interesting in itself, uh, until recently. Uh, but that is changing, and I'm just putting up some pictures of some recent books by my friends. You can think of these as kind of footnotes to what I'm talking about. Um, and then, of course, I need to promote my own uh, recent book. Uh, this is a project that was funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, um, a collection of essays by some colleagues uh, nationwide, trying to make sense of the current moment. Um, 
And uh, uh, so, a, a good bit of the remarks that I'm offering today are summarized in, in the introduction to this volume, uh, which is available free on the Stanford University Press website. Um, so if you'd like it to, you know, if you'd like to, to, to do some further inquiry, um, that's, a, that's an OER resource. Um, so what do I want to do today? Um, I want to give you, I, I, I want to um, give you a, 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 a highly edited snapshot of higher education in the United States as it was organized in the second half of the 20th century. This is a schoolhouse rock emoji representation, okay? If you want like the real version, you can, you can talk to these folks over here. Um, uh, but I want to give you a sort of a snapshot glimpse of some of the basic uh, components of the organization of higher education uh, in the post-World uh, uh, War II United States. I want to do an equally brief thumbnail sketch of, of um, the, the current moment in the sector. And hopefully that, um, and I want to emphasize uh, two uh, features of, of a transition uh, that, I, that I hope once I surface them um, might be useful for us to play with. Um, and those two features are measurement and sovereignty. Okay, and I should be say also that um, I'm also I'm invoking another one of those outdated relics of higher education tenure. Um, so I'm I'm not speaking on behalf of the university or the vice provost for teaching and learning or anything like that. I'm just a I'm just a kooky professor um, with some slides. Uh, uh, so if you have a problem with it, you can just talk to me. All right, so. Um, 20th century higher education. Uh, let's use let's use this this baby out well in here this thing that we're sitting in planet Stanford, right? The Archimedean point that is Stanford University and so many universities think of themselves as Archimedean points, right? Um, this this thing this nominally nominally legally private nonprofit organization was brought to the United States by multiple agencies of the federal government between, the, between 1930 and 1980. The government built Stanford University. It sent truckloads of money to the university during World Wars I, II, and especially during the Cold War. And Stanford got really good at getting federal money in much more canny, savvy ways than our, than our friends back east. Here's, here's the story, um, uh, the post-World War II story. So um, in the middle of the 20th century, Stanford's kind of a gentlemanly, kind of horsey university out in California. The real, the real intellect is at Berkeley, right? Um, we have this beautiful campus designed to impress the skeptical Eastern establishment. It's really hard to get here. It takes three days on the, rail, on the train to get here. Um, we had a bunch of money from Leland and Jane Stanford, but it didn't last nearly as long as anybody thought. Um, but we had some attributes. We had 8,000 acres of, of prime property that did not have Cambridge or New Haven or Providence, Rhode Island on it, right? So we could build stuff here and not bump into, uh, uh, into um, civic constraints. We had a weak faculty and a really strong administration um, so uh, presidents and provosts could kind of move things around um, really quickly without um, without bumping into um, without bumping into faculty restraint. Um, uh, uh, we had a burgeoning uh, 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 burgeoning uh, electronics um, and allied communications industries in the region, and we were three thousand miles away from Washington. So once the money came here, it was really hard for Washington to surveil what we were doing and figure out if we were doing it well or not. Okay, so you put all that stuff together along with some really canny leaders like Herbert Hoover um, and Frederick Terman and David Starr Jordan, um, uh, uh, plus a lot of plus of course a lot of good luck, um, and, and you get this sort of spectacular this spectacular officially private creature. Um, and the reason that the federal government invested so much money in higher education during the Cold War is that, I'm only focusing here on that 45 to 1980 period, is that universities did a lot of work on behalf of the government in, in, in the project of Cold War aggrandizement. So everyone talks about you know, getting to space and um, uh, investments in the defense industry, all of which is important. But, but government leaned on universities to do a lot more things than that. Um, 
Uh, it's easy for youngsters to forget that um, in the middle of the 20th century, there really was an alternative to American-style democratic capitalism on the world stage. And there was fierce anxiety in the United States that the other alternatives, specifically but not exclusively Soviet communism, might be a little more appealing to emerging nations in Latin America and South Asia and Africa than our version. And a great deal of intellectual investment was made in promulgating a, a conception of a, a democratic capitalist society that was open and porous and forward thinking and progressive and helpful. Um, the social sciences helped with that. The humanities helped with that. Um, uh, and uh, by doing this kind of, th this kind of uh, state building work through universities, Americans could have it both ways. We could successfully avoid being one of those democratic socialist welfare states in Northern Europe that we so despised, right? But we could still have a big government. It's just that the, the funds and capacities of that government would flow through the tentacles of nominally private uh, institutions like Stanford and also public ones like, like, uh, like Michigan and Berkeley. Uh, so in a very important way, uh, higher education kind of enabled the United States to advance its geopolitical ambitions during the Cold War. And this was great for academics because the money came in and we said, trust us, we're experts. We'll get back to you when the contract is up. And they said, okay, because you're Stanford and you're Harvard and you're Michigan and you know what's going on and everybody loves you because of these football games that you've been promulgating, <laughs> right? Like, don't tell me what's going on in the gender studies department at Indiana, but you know, go Hoosiers, right? All right, so it was great. It was a great time to be, it was a great time to be an academic. But it's important for us, the, the big point I want to take away is that higher education, during the era that I and my colleagues came of age, the universities that we inhabit are largely products of state, right? Another interesting thing, nice, great thing about the, the 20th century, uh, much of the 20th century, the opportunity costs of college were essentially lost wages. So um, uh, college was essentially free in a financial transaction sense for a great many Americans. Um, um, and so yeah, it, people, uh, uh, people are making decisions about going to college sort of independently of this, of this pesky loan problem that we talk about now. Um, and uh, there is a, a very minimal regulatory oversight of productivity. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, college happened in particular times and places. You had to go to college, right, during the academic year. Um, and here's the big point I want to spend some more time on. Uh, schools were sovereign over their operations, and faculty were sovereign over their classrooms. Now, sovereignty, now that's one of those academic luxury kinds of words, right? Um, so let's give it a definition. Sovereign, by sovereignty, right off the web, I mean the authority of an entity to govern itself. The authority of an entity to govern itself. And if that gets confusing, just think of that, okay? The authority of an entity to govern itself. Why is it that way, mommy? Because I'm the mommy, right? The authority of an entity to govern itself, right? So when I say schools were sovereign over their operations and faculty were sovereign over their classrooms, here's what I mean. And college admissions is a great example of this still. Here's how this works. Are you ready? 17-year-olds and their families line up around the block by the thousands and tens of thousands for the privilege of submitting an application to Stanford University, okay? And then they wait, and they wait, and they wait, and they wait, and 4% of the people who apply get the fat envelope, right? Tears of joy are shed, right? Grandparents called, parties convened, and then they fly to California and we tell them what they're gonna learn, right? They take our curriculum and then we evaluate them on the basis of our criteria which we control, right? Most of them get through but not all of them do and then they, then they walk across a dais 
and we give them a certificate, and they cry again, and they thank us again for the opportunity that we have given them to tell them what they need. And you know what? The federal government underwrites it all with tax exemption. And sometimes they get on the phone and they say, please, Stanford, would you give a little more money away? Please, Stanford, would you have a few more underrepresented minors? And we say, well, I suppose maybe that's all right. But don't ask us how we select them, OK? Because that's secret, right? That is a private process that happens in a secret building. And we can't, not even the Supreme Court is allowed to know whether Johnny was admitted to Stanford because he was a football player, or because he had good SAT scores, or because he was from North Dakota. Don't ask, right? Because we need to know. We need to decide that. OK, that's example one. Schools are sovereign over their operations. And faculty are sovereign over their classrooms. My first job was at one of those fancy colleges that you'd be glad to send your children to. I mean, fresh off the boat from Northwestern, I'm thinking, you know, let's kind of organize this department a little more, maybe sort of think about the curriculum in a more structured way. And I, I sent an email to my senior colleagues. I was like, you know, I just think we should collect all of the syllabi representing courses in the sociology department at this school. So we can just kind of look at them all and, and maybe plan the curriculum a little bit. <laughs> I don't have a syllabus. <laughs> I don't think syllabi should be on record. OK, it's my classroom, my syllabus, if I have one. Don't ask, kid. All right, 21st century higher education. A good bit of that re re remains. It, a good bit of what I described remains. But it's also the case that the Cold War ended, or we thought it did, and this thing called capitalism was globally accomplished. There are essentially no alternatives, even in the officially communist world. And, and need I tell you in this election year that the US has an ambiguous ideological relation to the world. We really can't decide what story the United States wants to tell the rest of the world. So these, these things called universities aren't serving, their, 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 the, don't have the clarity of the PR mission that they had um, during the Cold War. There's been essentially non-growth of public investment in higher education. That's a long, long story that we won't talk about now, but there's, the money is not coming in. Um, it's not growing uh, from public coffers, coupled with ever-increasing enrollments. Um, those of you at, at um, most public institutions in this country know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, there's a steadily rising cost of college and excess of, of inflation subsidized by the federal government. OK, we did this again. Cost of college was raising, rise has been rising faster than the rate of inflation for, for, gener, for a generation now. But stu, uh, subsidized student loans kind of buffered the, the cost, the apparent cost of that to families. Um, oh, no, no, it's good debt. It's good debt. Just good, good debt, un, un, unless, unless you don't finish college, and then, it, then it's problematic debt. But in any case, the opportunity costs of college now routinely inc include debt in a way that they just didn't in, in an earlier stage. Um, instructional provision is not bound by time and place. So that simple fact of co-presence, um, that, that cost center isn't necessarily there anymore. Um, and then this is the other um, thing I want to focus on. The measurement revolution has come to higher education. Uh, what do I mean by measurement? I mean something very simple, that. I mean measurement, basically. I mean the idea that, that values are going to be expressed metrically. That's all I mean. It seems so simple, doesn't it? Gosh, organizations ought to measure their productivity. No brainer, right? Except we've almost never done it in higher education. Almost never. Almost never. This measurement revolution happened first in K through 12 schools. It began with an, uh, arguably with the Nation at Risk report in 1982 and culminated with the No Child Left Behind Act in the middle of the 1990s. And it transformed the organization of K through 12 schooling. Now, I did not say that it, the measurement revolution made schooling better or more efficient or more transparent or more equitable. Those are conversations that my colleagues in the Graduate School of Education build their career on. 
I am saying that putting a ruler to schools changed how schools were organized, fundamentally, irrevocably. That process, which has transformed essentially all public bureaucracies uh, over the last 50 years, some call it neoliberalism, uh, that's come, that's come to us now. Such, such a simple idea, right? Let's just measure what we do and make decisions on the basis of clear and transparent and shared information. No brainer, right? Except, meanwhile, as I said before, higher education is now only provisionally a project of government. So governments out there you know, underwriting us in various ways. Uh, but we are no longer in the nation's service in the same way. People have this crazy idea that they imagine that the, their college education is theirs and they earned it and they paid for it. So, they, so it's the, 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 the joint venture aspect of higher education, that it's sort of simultaneously a project of government and your family and your institution, has really given way to this notion that um, higher education is a, a good that I am investing in and, and um, procuring. Um, tight government budgets and increasing demand for college means that there's a lot more entrepreneurial activity across the entire sector. One of the most, one of the, uh, 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 one sector that is being transformed at present is the um, comprehensive public post-secondary. So the, the Illinois states, the uh, southern Missouris, the central Floridas, the Purdue's, they're going after international applicants like wildfire, right? Because they, because the, because revenue from out of state or international students is revenue that you can spend. Um, so this, this cost crisis in higher education is, is having profound international implications as more and more US universities are increasingly seeking clients and patrons from all over the world. And nobody yet, knows how to measure quality. So as always, right, as always, the default for quality is going to the legacy brands, right? The Harvards, the MITs, the Stanfords, the, 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 um, uh, the Ermen Yilkildo Zenyas and Gucci's and Ralph Lauren's of higher education. Trust us, it's worth the money. It'll last you a long time. Goes with everything, really. You can wear that degree everywhere for the rest of your life. It's worth it. Pay, right? The legacy brands, AKA the, organ the university you're sitting in and the two that founded edX, they don't know what to do with the measurement revolution themselves. They don't know, we don't know. How this plays out, my bottom line, I have a few, just a few more minutes, I'll speak. How this plays out going forward awaits even conjecture. And what I would like to leave you with is a challenge to start conjecturing about this, all right? Even Cliff's Notes has an emoji now. And if you're under 40, you can ask somebody or Google what Cliff's Notes are, all right? Um, uh, here's, here's, here's the Cliff's Notes, all right? Measurement has come to higher education. Measurement has come to higher education. And in fact, digitally, well, we'll do that in a second. But what are we supposed to measure? Degree completion? Sure. Cost of college? Sure. Returns to earnings? Yeah, why not? How about learning? Oh, that's really complicated. We don't have instruments for that. How about Olympic medalists, right? Stanford would top this, right? <laughs> We're 22nd Director's Cup in a row this year, right? We could um, net of inputs, right? That's, that's the scary one for the legacy brands. 
we do great on all of these. Well, we don't know, we don't know about learning because we don't measure it. We don't have the instruments, really. The, the faculty are sovereign. They, can, they, they know. We just trust them in their classrooms, with or without their syllabi, <laughs> right? to accomplish learning. That's their responsibility, not the vice provost for teaching and learning. No, 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 no. All right? We do fine on Olympic medalists, but it's the net of inputs question that's the really hard one. Right? Controlling for all of the resource investments in each and every student at Legacy Brand U, do we really offer performance and value? Here's what we've hidden around, hidden, uh, on, uh, hi hidden behind for a long time on the learning point. If we wanted to measure learning, here's, here's what we've hidden behind. Measurement's really expensive. It's really costly. You have to write the instruments, and then you have to administer the instruments, and then you have to administer them longitudinally, and then you have to control for everything else, and then you have to train graduate students to crunch all of the data, and then you have to clean it, and then there's, it's really expensive. Yeah, it's expensive, but once this thing came along, right, the, the economic proposition of measurement has radically changed, right? If instructional opportunity is mediated through these things as a matter of course, if data collection happens as a matter of course at a level of magnitude never before experienced in the history of education research, it's kind of hard to say that we don't have the data, right? Um, uh, so there's the Cliff's Notes. And again, the question I want to leave you with, and then there'll be one more slide, is how this plays out going forward is what awaits conjecture. This is not even to my in, at least in the conversations and the circles I travel in, this sort of way of thinking about the, real, the challenge of measurement to sovereignty um, at this moment of, of crisis is, uh, not crisis, this moment of change in higher education, forgive me, um, has not even, um, I really did not want to use the C word, because um, I, don't, I don't actually don't believe it. Um, uh, it but I, I do think that this, this puzzle is um, really important. Um, how this plays out awaits even conjecture, but we do know this, and this is my last slide. Measurement <coughs> is no friend of sovereignty, <laughs> right? If you are sovereign, measurement should scare you, right? Because measurement cuts both ways. I'll stop there. Sarah, since we've got a volunteer for some mics, and then if you have a comment or a question, if you could stand and introduce yourself when you... Yeah. Hi, I'm Melanie James, University of Newcastle, Australia. Um, I'm interested to know your thoughts on um, well, what we call league tables, mm -hmm. US rankings um, and those mm -hmm. kind of things that we seem to want to live and die by in Australia at least. Um, we have a couple in the top 50, uh -huh. um, ANU for example, Australian National University. Um, you know, we get excited when we rank in the top 250 or top 300. Uh -huh. Um, and we advertise banners, top 3% in the world, you know, that kind of thing. Sure. Um, and all our metrics are now aligned to that, those kind mm -hmm. of tables. Where does that sit in, in this for legacy brands and also for the Purdue's and the, yeah. the state universities? Yeah, yeah. Um, that's, that's great. Uh, two things about uh, uh, rankings and league tables. We'll use them as synonyms. I think there's signals of two things. First is uh, the decline of the, pres the, um, the presumed exemption of universities from mere evaluation, right? I mean, if it, rankings said, oh, we can compare the University of Shanghai with Harvard University with Southern Missouri State, and there's no problem there because they're all comparable institutions. The idea that 
that institutions serve nations or preserve singular cultural identities or intellectual traditions is really challenged by league tables, right? University of Melbourne and the University of California at Berkeley can be ranked alongside one another. That in itself is a sort of a meaningful transformation in the value of higher education. Um, Oxford is just, you know, one pretty good institution in England, right? It's not Oxford, right? Um, so I think that's one, that's, it's a signal of the transformation that I'm talking about. Um, the other is that I, I, rankings became so, and some of my best friends write about rankings, um, they became so important, uh, or I would suggest, in response to the profound information asymmetries that both governments and families face vis-a-vis -vis universities, right? Uh, a few independent publications said, oh, maybe this trust us thing um, could be challenged. Maybe we could, maybe we could, um, we could get at reputation in less of a trust us kind of way. Um, and it was really outsiders to the academy that created rankings and league tables, um, and and uh, and and really did sort of transform the um, the jobs of a great many senior administrators in the process. Um, I do think we're in a moment where um, the future of rankings is. Um, it, uh, I, I think they're by virtue of. Uh, oh shoot! Oh well, I was going to look at the computer. I mean, I think we're in a position now where we're going to be looking at ever more. Um, uh, data streams describing colleges and universities and how people move through them sort of independently of the rankings. Um, but we haven't, that, that measurement apparatus has yet to be um, fully imagined by governments or universities. Uh, I'm going to let someone else make, make the call. How do I get my pretty slide back? Let's see. Oh, that'll work. Okay, good. Um, I'm listening. Yes. Okay. Um, I'm John Swope. I'm from uh, Curriculum. Uh, I've always been kind of intrigued that there's no or very little price discrimination in terms of university education. Like I went to NYU, I paid 200 and some thousand for a business degree. Um, and folks who study other fields that aren't kind of, uh, there's not as much of a return, there's no price discrimination for those. And I was wondering if there's like a reason for that, why that came about, and whether you think it's ever going to change at any point. Um, it already is changing, okay. actually. It's already um, uh, very much under um, renegotiation. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of, I mean, people have talked about ch um, you know, charging varying amounts for um, undergraduate degree programs. Um, but a lot of that differentiation is now um, uh, happening by, at, the, at the level of the, um, uh, 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 the, the post-baccalaureate space, I think it's extremely dynamic. Um, the, the code academies and boot camps are taking this as, as a, full, a full frontal attack on, you know, we are the new master's degree, right? Why invest that much time and money when you can have something equivalent? My answer to your question would be, I think it's another, it's a function of the extraordinary trust that Americans and, and government, the US government has placed in universities. The trust us thing has really worked for, Three generations. Um, and I think that's what the legacy brands are now struggling with. They, in, they inherit a great deal of trust. Um, but I think we also recognize that we're, we're going to have to kind of explain ourselves uh, in different ways going forward. Um, but I, again, I think, it's, I think it's a function of the fact that people imagine that we know what we're doing and that we're pricing our, our services appropriately. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hi, Hi, I'm Nina Hunteman. I'm the Director of Research and Academics at edX, and I'm a recovering faculty member. Uh, <laughs> Good for you. I spent 15 years um, in higher ed. I guess I'm still in higher ed. Um, my question for you, so I feel very deeply um, both how a faculty member responds to the measurement question, and I also, as someone who cares about actually showing teaching and learning accomplishment mm -hmm. about the need for measurement and assessment. Um, but I know a lot of my colleagues, myself too, we look to what happened in K through 12 and shudder at who's mm -hmm. deciding what the measurements are and what those measurements are tied to. And I'm thinking specifically about the public universities mm -hmm. who may face the same pressures as the public K through 12 to bring in measurements that we're now all looking at. And I'm sure mm -hmm. parents in the room of US kids at public schools yeah. know this. Um, has right. very little, it's very little about teaching and learning. It's about mm -hmm. counting. And so there's a balance there, right? Mm -hmm. And I think there's still a place for sovereignty among faculty members to decide in collaboration what those measurements should be. But do you see a workable path that's not going to land us where 
K through 12 did? Um, you know what let's do? Let's, can we collect a few questions and then, and like the gentleman in front, stand up and say your name and let's just, that'll give us some more input um, and then I'll make a, a remark or two at the end. Go ahead. Uh, name is Nima. Uh, I wanted to know what your thoughts are on income share agreements for students oh, right. and whether faculty right. who are teaching a course should have a stake in their students. Right. Right, Future incomes. right, right. How about two more? Is there somebody just um, over here, sir? I'm sorry, I didn't realize you had a microphone. Please stand, if you can. I'm yeah. Deepak Fatak. I, I'm a teacher at IIT Bombay. Very good. Uh, we are one of the legacy brands in India. Since we have borrowed heavily from MIT and Stanford, we also don't publish our syllabus. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, one point that I would like to make is that these legacy brands are legacy brands primarily for two reasons. One is we admit the smartest of the smart students. We assemble a reasonably smart faculty which is willing to challenge students' minds. So I believe the learning happens. It just happens. I don't think anything has to be done for learning to happen. As long as we don't come in the way of these students for four years, they will end up learning. The point is not that. The point is that not only legacy universities, but all other universities, I agree with you that it is the enormous trust that not just the government, but the society puts in us, which drives us. But suppose tomorrow, the independent knowledge channels, such as MOOCs, and independent certification channels, may be supported by industry, yeah. if they come up, and if the employers start believing that I don't need to hire a student from Sanford. Mm -hmm. The other fellow is as good. Mm -hmm. What will happen to the arrogance of the university system? Mm -hmm. It may be 50 years later, maybe uh -huh. 10 years later. We don't know how. But is measurement the only response to it? Or having done some measurements, and again, we are uh -huh. not very clear how you measure, uh -huh. particularly learning, has there to be a strategy to incorporate both the online education and face-to-face -face education together so that the universities could remain viable and meaningful for a longer time. Mm -hmm. Beautifully, beautifully articulated, thank you. Um, let, me, let me take a stab at a, at a few things um, here. Uh, um, first of all, by no means am I suggesting that a giant ruler is the only thing that has changed higher education in the United States over the last 20 years. I do think it's a very useful mechanism for thinking about lots of other negotiations over cost and jurisdiction and performance and productivity and science. Um, uh, so I, I think it's a lens for talking about a bunch of other stuff. Um, secondly, um, the outgoing president of Stanford um, was made uh, a, a, an infamous remark uh, 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 in, in invoking the, the word tsunami to describe what was seen, he thought was happening um, in higher education in the US in 2011. Um, I think the problem with that metaphor is only time scale. Tsunamis happen fast, <laughs> right? The, the, the changes that I'm trying to summarize here are, are transformative, but they're happening at a different pace, right? That's why I think the word crisis is not correct. I mean, I think we're, we're looking at an ongoing renegotiation of how value is and responsibility are to be organized in higher education. What's quality? How do we know we have it? Who pays for it? Under what conditions? According to the laws of which national state or not, right? That's, that's the big, the big um, change. I am focusing on the legacy brands in my remarks here even though they represent a tiny minority of the ecosystem and serve a tiny minority of the students because, because they have, in the United States, they have really set the terms over the course of the 20th century over the relationship between government and higher education. The legacy brands in many ways provided cover for the rest of the sector on the trust us thing, right? Trust us because we are just like the legacy brands we trained at the legacy brands. We go to academic conferences with the legacy brands. We're just like them. The same rules should apply. 
that I think is one of the, the whether the extent to which that presumed cohesion of the whole sector is going to hold, right, vis-a-vis -vis these trust questions, I think is one of the largest open questions in the politics of higher education at present. You know, who gets to govern themselves and who gets to have a great big foundation headquartered on the, in the, the western third of the United States make the rules for them, right? Um, there's this outfit in Indianapolis that thinks it knows what a, you know, what qualifies for a college degree, right? Who has to play by those rules? Um, I think we haven't even started to ask those kinds of questions. Um, do I think that the, that the, um, uh, that the, the current privilege that the legacy brands enjoy is fragile? Absolutely. It's absolutely fragile. Pri privilege is always fragile. But the great thing about having privilege is it's a lot easier to keep it than it is to get it from somewhere else. And so um, I think what's so interesting and important about this moment um, is that um, institutions that have the means um, uh, and the influence to really to make history in concert with their peers across the sector, it's really, it's really up to them to decide what kind of history they want to make or nudge. Um, and that to me is why I think I think the whole project of ed edX and open edX is so important because um, it's creating conversations and relationships among a wide variety of schools um, that we haven't been able to achieve before. Um, uh, so um, let's you know let's start conjecturing and 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 think about you know what what kind of higher education future we we want to build. Yeah, one more. Yes, sir. Uh, name is Chinmay. Thanks for a great talk. Uh, I'm working in the corporate uh, learning space right now, and where measurement is more immediate and important. Yeah. I'm just curious uh, what efforts and experiments that you've come across uh, about measurement in education in general, offline or online, uh, that are interesting to you and where do you see uh, something of interest that, can, that we can conjecture about for yeah. the future? Yeah, and then, I'll, um, and, and then I, I know we need to conclude. I don't have to run away right away, so if people would like to continue a conversation, I'd be more than happy to do that. Um, um, I would say one of the most interesting things, I would say one thing that we all should keep an eye on, um, whether or not we take Title IV money, we, we want to we wanna watch the Department of Education figure out um, the, the, ter the conditions under which um, um, entities, whether they're schools or not, are going to be eligible for Title IV funding. Frankly, I'd, I'd prefer that the Academy um, help the next administration decide um, uh, what kinds of educational services are worthy of those funds. I would much prefer that um, uh, organizations represented in this room offer the next Department of Education ways of thinking about value and that we don't wait around for the Department of Education or, dare I say, the Federal Trade Commission to tell us what kinds of services are worthy of government subsidy. Let's stop there. <laughs>